Well, our final presenter today will bring all of the information you've heard today kind of together to talk about what we're doing in nursing education here at Creighton. And um, I'm just thrilled, too, to have Dr. Mary Coons Connell to deliver that. She is truly an expert in all things curriculum, as I'll share with you in some of her bio sketch. Dr. Coons Connell is a professor and also the Associate Dean for Academic and Clinical Affairs here at Creighton University School of Nursing. She's alumni of our School of Nursing and also earned her PhD at the University of Nebraska in um, the area of adult education and community programming. She is greatly admired for, uh, for her work and her scholarship in psychiatric nursing, which is her, she's prepared as a clinical nurse specialist in that area. She and her colleague, Dr. Joan Norris, <coughs> did some amazing scholarship in the area of self-esteem and body image. As a matter of fact, one of the diagnoses that they developed in the area of body image was accepted by the NANDA as one of the universal um, diagnoses, nursing diagnoses, the self-esteem disturbance. She has done a grounded theory work in the area of re-imaging body imaging, following a body image disturbance, and from that work, um, the qualitative study that they've done is still considered the exemplar in qualitative research and is often cited throughout schools globally um, as they're teaching students about qualitative research. She is um, a leader in curriculum issues and in faculty relations. She has developed many of the curricula and been an integral part of the curricular development here at the School of Nursing. But she also serves as a team leader and an on-site evaluator for the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, which evaluates nursing programs that are a bachelor's degree and higher. She also serves as a consultant evaluator and team leader for the North Central Higher Learning Commission that accredits colleges and universities. Um, she continues to serve in leadership roles in nursing as well as across our campus in all things education. And with that, Dr. Coons Connell will share with us what we're doing in nursing education. First of all, I would like to thank the School of Nursing and this planning committee for the um, honor of being able to present on the, beh on the behalf of my colleagues the model that uh, Creighton has chosen to prepare its students for 21st century health care. Um, but secondly, I, I would like to tell you that I'm quite privileged. I usually don't like to be a last speaker because I know everybody wants to go to lunch, um, and that's okay. Um, but I am very privileged because everybody did my work for me. My work is done in the previous four speakers. So, so I want, I, what I want you to do is we're going to do a couple of things here. I need you, first of all, to shift gears. Dr. Zetterman started it by talking about interprofessional education. I want to tell you a little bit about now what we do specifically in nursing education and where we need to go in nursing education. But the second thing I want is I want you to kind of look at each other first. And first I want to take the alumni and I want to take nurses who are not alumni and I want to ask you one question. How many of you are raised in the nursing process? Raise your hands. Were you taught the nursing process? How many of you use the nursing process? Okay, for the students sitting here, have you heard of something called the care management model? But we won't laugh at that. Do your books talk about the nursing process? Now it's, did they read their book? Would be the question we would be asking. Because I did read a couple of them. They do still talk about that nursing process. I want to talk to you about not only what we do, but the journey with which we got there. And to do that, I want to present it in the context of Clayton Christensen's new theory, or, or popular theory, if you will, called the Theory of Disruptive Innovations. How many of you have heard of it? Very few of you. It was done by Clayton Christensen. If you haven't picked up the books, my suggestion would be to. He's written The Innovator's Dilemma. The, inter, uh, the prescriptive innovator about healthcare, and for those of you in academia, the innovative university. And he's developed this model called disruptive innovation. And I started reading about that, and I thought, oh, I, I think this might work. So let me tell you a little bit about it. He says that organizations, people, businesses, they innovate. 
They sometimes develop something, whether it's a process, a service, uh, a piece of equipment that is unique and that moves us forward. It changes, it improves us, okay? It's an innovation, so we talk about it, it's an innovation. And we keep up that innovation because we all like it. And pretty soon people start to emulate it. Other organizations emulate it. Other professions maybe even emulate parts of it. But he says that things change. The environment changes. Whether it's fiscal, whether it's human change, it doesn't matter the source of it. We change. And change creates opportunity and it creates threat. And what you heard this morning is you heard four very eloquent speakers talking to you about healthcare change. You heard Dr. Zetterman in particular talk to you a little bit more about how that's weaving into healthcare profession change. So we have change. Uh oh. Oh no, I keep going backwards. I am a little challenged. So we have changes. Now what Clayton Christian would, would say is that what organizations tend to do is they take that innovation that they developed and they keep using it, even in times of change. And what they do with it is they make it bigger and better. They never question it. They never question the fundamental premise of it. They just keep making it bigger and better. And you know what it'll do? It'll get us through that change. It'll make us bigger and better. We don't question it. So it just gets bigger and better. And he says it eventually becomes ingrained in our DNA. It becomes ingrained in the DNA of our organization, in the DNA of our profession. Keep that in mind. So there it is. It keeps getting, I could have made it a little bigger and better. I kind of did. It keeps getting bigger and better. She says there's a problem. He says that sometimes bigger and better doesn't cut it. And that what some organizations do, what some professions do, what some individuals do is they disrupt it. They take what they had, they take the good from it, but they fundamentally question it. And they begin to disrupt its DNA. And they create new DNA. The problem, he says, though, is that what happens with these disruptors is they're not always well accepted initially. Because people keep thinking, hey, we work, we work over here. We don't need the other. So that's his theory in a nutshell. Now, let's take it to nursing and the nursing process. You all know this, don't you? We assess, plan, intervene, and evaluate. Do you know that the nursing process is considered the core or the cornerstone of nursing practice and nursing education? It was developed over 55 years ago by Ida Jean Orlando, and she set out to specifically define what we do as nurses. That was her premise. Clayton would definitely consider her an innovator, a shaker, a mover. And she did it within the context and the premise of nursing at that time. First of all, nursing in the 50s and 60s was primarily, of course, centered in the hospital. And it was based on meeting the immediate needs of the immediate patient in the immediate environment. Those are important things to remember. She developed nursing process based on that premise. She also developed the nursing process based on the premise that there were some debates starting to go on about education in nursing. Should we continue to educate in the hospitals at the bedside? Or should we start to take it into these institutions of higher learning? And not only that, she wanted us to re-image ourselves. Because historically, we were looked at as utility or task. Handmaiden sometimes was a word that was defined for us. She wanted us to look differently. She wanted us to be more independent. So she wanted to create something that helped us to be our own. Hence, we got the nursing process. Assessment, planning, intervention, evaluation. EP, or EPI, or API, however you want to choose it. Okay, so now we got the 50s, the 60s. People like it. Nursing education also loved it. It became us in nursing education. 
this is how we teach. There was not a lecture you would probably go into where you would dis wouldn't discuss the nursing process. It's because it's what we are. It was our framework for how we thought. So guess what? Change occurred in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We kept getting bigger and better. We kept the nursing process, but in 73, we added nursing diagnosis. Because see, it was a nomenclature that was specifically nursing. And it made us more independent because these were things that we could diagnose as nurses and we could intervene as nurses independently of others. So we, we even got bigger and better than that. In 1991, we added outcome identification. Kind of had to put those in there somewhere. Starting to become important. Alas, healthcare changes, nursing education changes. Based on the four speakers today, they, they did this so, for, so well for me. They talked about all these changes today. I'm not going to go through them all with you, but you heard about the economics. You heard about access. You heard about electronic health records and communication. You heard about the boundaries lessening in healthcare. You heard about the need to coordinate care not only from hospital to another health care, but hospital to non-health care, non-health care to non-health care, population-based care, technology coming into play, access being denied, issues related to um, insurance, issues related to access. You heard about the need to be a team. We've got to work together. We have to care coordinate. We need languages to help us care coordinate. You heard Dr. Abbott talk about we need languages to help people understand, to help the patients understand um, what, what's going on. And, people, and that disciplines need to communicate effectively with each other. You heard all of that. That's the world we live in. You didn't hear as much yet about how we're transforming nursing education. So the question you have to ask yourself in practice, those of you in practice, you need to ask yourself not so much whether the nursing process has been valuable and relevant to moving us forward in the past, but you need to challenge yourself in your systems to say, is it the most relevant to where we are going in the future? Is it the most relevant to, to be a nurse in a society that has such complex health care needs? In an environment where we're trying to break down the silos between the disciplines, and we need a language that breaks down those silos. In an environment where the centrality of what we do is caring for the patient, not what we do as a nursing process. Are you challenging your peers? Are you challenging your systems in that way? Are they challenging you? And in nursing education, where we seem to be oftentimes is, what new technique can we use? Let's do problem-based learning now. Let's do this. What we haven't done all the time is we haven't challenged the fundamental paradigm of nursing education, and that is the nursing process. And only after we challenge that can we challenge our teaching learning processes. Now, with that in mind, I want you to see the nursing process is incredibly innovative and was very innovative for the time. It focused on individuals. It has an absence of family, community, group, and population. It focuses on the immediate response of the individual. It has an absence of the broader view of care that is beyond the immediate response. It focuses generally on direct care. It has an absence of nursing's role in indirect care, including policy, research, quality improvement that influences care. It focuses primarily on short-term episodic care. It has the absence of focus on the complexities associated with chronic care. It has a focus on process. It has an absence of outcomes as being the forefront of what you are looking at. It has a focus on the primacy of the relationship between the nurse and the patient. But what it has, what it doesn't have, is it has an absence of the focus on the balance between the quality of care, the relationship with that patient, and the cost of delivering that care. And it focuses on the independence of nursing. It has an absence by the use of its language on the interdependency in healthcare. And so I'm hoping that what I say to do is making you, what I'm saying today is making you angry. I want you to say, I really don't like her presentation. 
because it's making me have to think, is this really occurring? And is this really what we still te teach to? And I am not not advocating the nursing process, but now I want to take you to Creighton University School of Nursing. And I want to really put it in perspective by saying I'm taking you to the 1990s in Creighton University School of Nursing, particularly the mid-90s. In the mid-90s, I do have to look at my notes a little bit. In the mid-90s, due to the visionary leadership of our previous dean, Dr. Edith Kitchens, and our present dean, Dr. Eleanor Howell, the faculty were kind of challenged. Yeah, we got to meet one day. We had those retreat things. So we got to meet. And so we were thinking, oh, good, we're just going to, you know, take a few courses, move them around, do a little, a little different teaching. No, 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 no. The question that was asked to us was, not, and I'm going to change the words a little bit, not how do you sustain the present nursing process model and how do you change your teaching and learning practices to fit that model, but rather how do you disrupt that model reinvent the model for where healthcare is going, and then look to your teaching and learning practices and how they also need to be altered. So we didn't spend a lot of time talking about our teaching and learning practices. We spent a lot of time talking about our model. And we changed our model. We fundamentally questioned it. Not that we didn't keep some of the good things, but we fundamentally questioned it. So now our students, what they see, hopefully, in their first few days of class at junior level or in the accelerated program, and in the graduate program if they have not been an undergraduate for us or with us, and what's in our handbooks and what defines our style of teaching is something called the care management model. We took the words nursing process out. So I'm not going to read this model to you. I highlighted different things, but I want you to read this and listen to what we did. We took out the words nursing process. We began to shift the paradigm away from what we considered a more siloed approach. And we shifted the, the paradigm from not what we do, not our process, but what our ultimate purpose is, and that is to manage the care of that client. And we define client broadly as individual, group, family, community, or population. We also focused on outcomes. And we focused specifically on quality, clinical, and cost outcomes. What, when I was here back in the 70s, I never understood that issue of cost. Our students today do understand that issue of cost. And they're expected to use that issue of cost in planning their care. We also made our assessments and our management strategies. We didn't call them nursing interventions as much anymore as we did management strategies. Because that was a more global, a more inclusive type of communication. They're much broader and more comprehensive. And you'll see them in a minute. And the stronger focus is on who we are as a team. It occur, occurs in the climate of partnership. And I always tell the students, I personally like the second paragraph. Because I said they've got about 40 some years of having to assess, plan, provide, negotiate, coordinate, and evaluate options and services to achieve cost quality effective outcomes in a climate of partnership with individuals and serving as care manager. They have a lot to do. We need to prepare them to do that. Here's our model. There's the nursing process model off to the left. Now, Mary, you're going to say, Mary, all you did was get bigger and better. No, we didn't. One of the things Christian would, would say in his model is that you do appreciate the history. And you don't get rid of the history. But you fundamentally question it. And that's what we did. Look at what is at the forefront of our model. Not assessment, expected outcomes. We start with outcomes for our students, and I'll go through that in a minute. I want you to look at these, and I will take you through them now very quickly. First of all, we require of our students to put it in a macro perspective, population profile. So wherever they go, it doesn't matter what setting they're in. 
Wherever they go, they have to look at the population. For instance, some of our students right now are probably doing school-based settings. Or they go to a school-based area and they work with a healthy pediatric population. So yeah, they may only screen 20 kids. But what they have to know is they have to understand that population. They have to understand the adolescent if they're going into a high school. They have to understand um, what issue, health issues affect them. They have to understand their cognitive development. They have to understand the social processes affecting them. They have to understand everything that's going on around them. And then they can screen the 20 little kids that they're screening. We need to see it more than just you're going in there and dealing with one person. What does it mean from a population perspective? We expect all of our students to provide general demographics, demographic trends of the population, incidence and prevalence of key issues if it's a disease, or what could be the key issue or the key health care issues conf potentially confronting them. We want them to look at morbidity, mortality, risk factors, social processes, access costs, and it must be done across the continuum of care. That's the first step. And they know they have to write it. That's the first step. Then we have them look at population-based outcomes. What if, if you have a diabetic, if you're working with a gentleman who's a diabetic, yes, you're going to be working with him, but you need to understand diabetes. You maybe need to understand it in the older population. We want you to look at those clinical outcomes. We want you to identify what the outcomes are for that population first. What are the clinical outcomes for the diabetic population, the older adult? What are the quality, and clinical we define as uh, phys physiological and mental health. What are the quality outcomes? Quality we define for the students as functional, role performance, quality of life, quality of health care given, and cost, indirect and direct cost. They must identify outcomes in those areas, but those outcomes are based on population. They're based on evidence. They must use their text. They must go to the articles. They must find that first. That's what's going to drive their care. Now you're going to say, well, but you're not being individually focused. Oh, wait, we'll get there. Then we have assessment categories. And we identify seven general assessment categories for the students. And we pulled these from a, a lengthy review of the, of the literature, as well as consensus in the, in the healthcare profession. We look at health assessments, screening diagnostic tests, the personal values includes everything from development, culture, um, um, socioeconomic, et cetera. Functional assessments, IEDLs, ADLs, role performance, family social support assessments. They do everything from the genograms to look at genetics. I, they do it all. We have good students and good alumni. They do environmental assessments, and they look at resources, whether they're financial resources, community resources. We require those assessments to be made for the population, but we also require them to be made for their individual client or their family or their group. So they have to take that macro, and then they have to bring it down to the micro and say, here's the, my population, but here's my patient. How does my patient fit? So they have to go through a fairly lengthy analysis where they then have to take that actual client profile that they've done their assessments on also and compare it to the population. Compare it, what is the outcome, where is that client status in relationship to those population-based outcomes? If they have a blood sugar of 489, how does that compare with what the population of diabetics should have? How does that compare? And then we have them discuss variance between expected outcomes and the client present status. And not just say, oh, there's a variance there. They're not meeting the population outcome. They have to determine why. So they have to go back and say, what were their risk factors, or what are their care practices, or what are whatever that might lead them to this. Then we take problem identification. No, we did not say nursing diagnosis there. Do we not use nursing diagnosis? If it works, it might be used. As Dr. Howell told you, I helped develop one of them. I'm not opposed to it but it's not always the language we should be using. I'm not sure if I want to go up to a, a physician and say, he has a thermal regulation problem. <laughs> They're going to look at me like, really, Mary? Really? You know, if I told one of the psychiatrists that they have altered sensory perception, they would say, what kinds of hallucinations are they experiencing? Okay? So problem identification, not everything fits into that nursing diagnosis. And problems are multidisciplinary. Keep that in mind. The constipation is not just something nursing deals with. I have to work with pharmacy. I might have to work with somebody else, right? 
It's not something. You listen to the speakers this morning. Did they tell you everything was done in isolation? No. And then, though, we do go to the micro level, individualized client outcomes. But those outcomes must not be congruent with, but they must be correlated to the population ones. So for those population ones, the student then has to say, oh, how does that fit that? How am I getting to that? How am I working towards that? Then we go into our care management strategies. And we have, a we have a framework of nine categories of strategies that we work with the students on. Everything from symptom management to medication management to what skills and technology, social and behavioral management strategies, counseling, relationship-based care, caregiver, education referrals, can be used across individuals, communities, groups, populations. It can be used across the continuum of care. It's not specific to the immediate needs of the immediate client in the immediate setting, though it could be. My, fav my favorite is the first graduating class we had once we started this. The student got up and was presenting her presentation, and she said, I had a patient in ICU, and they were getting ready to go home. And I started to re really realize where they would be a year from now, and I planned for that. I thought, oh, you got it. You got it. That is what we want. We have a whole section, a whole part of our model. Because of students, we recognize as, as pr practitioners that we do this. But the students don't always at this point. So we have separated out in our model um, key collaborators and partners. Who, who else within nursing do they need to consult with? Who else within the multidisciplinary team? Who in the community? What about your payers? They're, they get kind of shocked at that one. Payers? I'm, oh, yes, you will be. What are your legislative and poly, policy contacts? Some of our students and in, in, in some of their groups have actually worked with potential gubernatorial candidates and helped them look at policy. That was their clinic, their clinical. How exciting is that? Or when you're in the hospital, I, I love it in psych when I can sit and say, how is that affecting? Let's take what's in the newspaper and look at how that's affecting policy here for mental health. What's happening? You've got to get them thinking like that. That may be indirect care, but it's critical. And that's what we want our students to, to understand. And then I thought it was interesting. I think it was Wendell said, asked this morning about clients. What we end up doing is we do have the students evaluate their client or their family or whomever in relationship not only to the individual client outcomes but the population outcomes. But we take it from a quality improvement perspective now. And we say, if there is a variance, we say, did they improve? Did they stay the same or did they worsen? Stay, improve or get worse are variances. And that's what we try to tell the students. Not just get worse as a variance, but improve maybe quickly. If I have a patient whose normal length of stay is supposed to be three days, and they get to go home in two, and they're doing better, that could be an improvement. As Dr. Howell pointed out this morning, all the issues related to discharge and what it really does mean. So we say, is the improvement or the worsening related to the client? Something the client is doing. Is it related to care, my care, your care? So we have to look at what we are as practitioners, that self-reflection. And we require the students to do that. We require that of ourselves. Is there something that I am doing that may be making that variance occur, good or bad? And we look at system. I pointed out a long time ago that I said, I, I thought it was the most fascinating thing for me was one of my patients was um, supposed to be transferred from an adult ICU unit to like a, a regional care center, and this was many, many years ago, and ended up spending 10 extra days in the ICU unit. And, and those of you in psych would probably know how much that cost, 10 extra days in an ICU unit, all because the bus that would transport them from the, IC, or from the hospital to the regional care center, which at that time was about 250 a day at the regional care center compared to what it was in the hospital, was broken. That's a system issue. Communication is a system issue. So 
But we don't make the student stop there. Oh, it, wor it got worse because of the client. We make them identify strategies to say, what are you going to do differently? And what are you going to do? It's not, well, if I were the nurse, I'd go, no, 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 no. Not if you were the nurse. What are you going to do as part of the healthcare team? Now, Dr. Costanzo pointed up the book from the IOM that came out in 2010 or 11, The Future of Nursing Leading Change in Advancing Health. I want to end with two quotations, well, about three quotations from there. Now, remember, this book came out in 2011. I'm talking about what Creighton University did in the mid-90s. So I want you to look at these quotes carefully. The first one. The intricacies of care coordination are not adequately addressed. Nursing students may gain exposure to leading healthcare disciplines and know something about basic health policy and available health and social programs. However, their education does not provide them the skills needed to negotiate with the healthcare team, navigate the regularity and access stipulations, or understand how these program and health policies impact health outcomes. Nursing curricula need to be re-examined and updated. I would question that. I think it needs to be reinvented. They need to be adaptive enough to undergo continuous evaluation and improvement based on new evidence and changing science base, changes in advancement in technology. The next quote's what I think is most interesting. They need to adopt reconceptualized roles as care coordinators, health coach, coaches, and system innovators. Filling these roles, whether in entry level or advanced practice, will require that nurses receive greater education and preparation in leadership, care management, quality improvement, and systems thinking. 2011, that was written. Creighton University, 1996. Okay, a little ahead of ourselves. Nursing education at all levels needs to provide a better understanding experience in, I did capitalize those, by the way. They didn't. In care management, quality improvement, systems level thinking management, and the reconceptualized roles of nursing in a reformed healthcare system. Questions? Comments? You want to go to lunch? Well, thank you. Oh, oh, sorry. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kuz Connell. That was stimulating, even for those of us who do academics every day. Enjoyed it. Thank you.